It's great to be here this morning. We'd like to welcome each of you to the assembly. We're happy for this time uh, this morning to be together and happy for the privilege of worship this morning in spirit and in truth. Appreciate um, very much the song selection this morning. It's just been great and it certainly has focused us on uh, the things that we ought to be focused on in our time together this morning. And so appreciate that very much. We're going to be studying together this morning our final study from the book of Philippians. And as we come to this particular study, we come to the conclusion of the book in chapter 4. And uh, this is, in, in some ways, probably the most familiar section of the book. Um, this is the section I think I have probably heard preached most often, and uh, maybe even I myself have talked about these verses most often. They are kind of a bunch of go-to verses in Philippians chapter 4. And so we look to kind of talking forward to talking about those this morning. Our goal, though, is to be able to understand those within the context of the book itself. And of course, as we have surveyed the book of Philippians, uh, we have identified together the basic outline of the book, where you have this congregation who's concerned Things have really not gone like they thought they would. And so Paul writes this book to provide them with direction and encouragement. Um, this is not a book filled with correction and in, like harsh reproof and an attack on false doctrine and all those sorts of things. That's not really what this book is like. It's different than something like 1 Corinthians or Galatians. Uh, where Paul has to be sort of aggressive almost in dealing with changes to the gospel. That's not what Philippians is like. Philippians is a book written to a good congregation full of good people trying to do good things and encouraging them keep going. And there's kind of two main messages in Philippians. Keep going together. Stay united and keep going with the joy of the Lord in your hearts. And so whatever life brings, you just have the joy of the Lord in your hearts and you go on together and stay together. And those twin themes are kind of mixed all throughout this particular book. It's set against the backdrop of his own personal experience where he himself is imprisoned when he writes the book of Philippians. And where that would seem like the worst possible thing that could happen, that all of a sudden Paul, who had gone everywhere and done everything, was limited. He shows them, actually, it's turned out to be a good thing. And it's provided me with opportunities I wouldn't have had otherwise. And so the first lesson, we talked about how that the imprisonment, counterintuitively, it had provided him with a platform, this opportunity and that he wanted them to recognize that they themselves, in the second section there on the Passion, they had as well the opportunity of a platform. But the way they needed to do it was to be, just like Paul did, follow Jesus Christ. And if we will live like Jesus died, then we ourselves can have this platform uh, wherever life brings and we can ultimately have this platform. And then if we will do that, if we'll have that mindset, the third lesson is about the possibilities. And what can happen if we will do that? Well, we can be a light in this world. And if we were to just summarize the third lesson there, that's the idea that by adopting that mindset and having that consistent character and attitude, and that second lesson is really all about attitudes, if we'll have the right attitudes, just like Jesus did, then the possibilities are that we can do great things in this world. And we don't have to be Paul and we don't have to be Jesus to do that. In fact, we learn that Ep Epaphroditus did great things and Timothy did great things by doing those very things that Paul teaches in those particular chapters. And so what will get in the way? What's going to keep us from being successful? And so in chapter 3, in the very first verse of chapter 4, we talk about the peril. The peril, the real danger. And what could prevent the Christian from really accomplishing all these wonderful things, from having the right attitude and achieving the goals that God has for our life that we would 
shine out as lights. Well, the peril is, it's just really almost shocking what it is. It's Paul's past. But it's not his past failures. It's his past accomplishments. And the peril is finding our identity and our worth in our own personal accomplishments instead of in Christ. And if our identity and our worth is all about ourselves and all about what we have accomplished, we will not have the right attitudes and we will not be the light. And so accomplishments, well, they're dangerous for all of us. They're very dangerous. We work hard for them and all of that, but that's not who we are. And the teaching really in chapter 3 is we really only understand correctly who we are when we think about our identity as it relates to Jesus Christ. And so that's how to overcome that peril. So this morning we come to the idea of the path of peace. To begin our study this morning on this particular section of the book, I'd actually like to read with you from chapter 1, just to sort of remind you of what his ultimate goal was for them. As he began the book, he had some hopes for them, and I think we'll be able to recognize some connections between these initial moments in the epistle and the conclusion to the epistle. So let's read together Philippians chapter 1. We'll read verses 3 through 11, um, where here is... Paul's goal for them. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request of you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart, is much in both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospels, or of the gospel, excuse me, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. These beautiful words here are his hopes for this church. And so as we come to the final section here, in order for those hopes to be realized, he's kind of walk through these ideas of these twin themes of joy and unity. And now he's going to show how to ultimately walk through this, this path of peace. And in order for us to be able to truly accomplish the goals of Philippians chapter 1, we have to pursue the path of peace. And here's the main thing that we want to learn from Philippians chapter 4. We don't build pathways so we can stand still. Pathways are built so we can move. And in every one of these, there's movement. The danger in Philippians chapter 4 is to be paralyzed into an action. That's when we have trouble. Or paralyzed by repeating the same unhealthy or negative actions over and over. The pathway of peace, it gives us a prescription here of things we need to do to keep going forward. And sometimes in life, Uh, When we have different challenges or different opportunities or whatever, we can be tempted to sort of, spiritually speaking, put ourselves at a standstill. Take a pause. That's dangerous. The pathway of peace means we've got to keep going forward. And we can't get stuck. We can't get stuck. So let's talk about how that works as we walk through each of these different sections. I want to notice, first of all, That this pathway of peace, this pathway of constant spiritual progress, involves, first of all, the concept of resolution. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, here's what Paul says. I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, 
Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So as we begin looking at this particular section, just imagine sitting in this assembly, the first time this is read, and there sits Yodia, and there sits Syntyche, and they're certainly not going to sit together, they're not going to sit on the same side of the building together and all that. You're just sitting here listening to this letter, and all of a sudden, boom, here comes your name. That's shocking. That's shocking. Reminds me of the look on Micah's face when he was a little. And uh, he was making some rather questionable decisions in church one time when I was up teaching. And I said, Micah, sit up. <laughs> and kept on with the lesson. The look on his face was really something. And he sat up and he did fine. And look at him this morning. He's just doing great. Just sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that shock, though, that's what they must have felt, right? All of a sudden, wow, why is my name in this letter? And why have we got to drag all this out in front of everybody? My name right here in this letter. The, the, vo the verbiage is interesting. I implore you. This isn't a command. This isn't Paul using his apostolic authority to sort of insist. No, he's, I implore you. Come on, guys. Come on. We've got to work this out. And what was it they needed to work out? I don't know. We don't know, but they sure did. They didn't wonder what he was talking about when they heard their names, did they? As <clears throat> shocking as it might have been to hear their names, they were not shocked that there was a problem between the two of them. They both knew it. And the admonition here, the encouragement, what he wants them to do, be of the same Mind. One uh, version of this I read mentioned the idea of, you know, being in harmony. Find a way to be in harmony. Maybe what's happening here, maybe this is just a personality clash. Maybe they just have, they're just different, maybe they're different seasons in life and they're just kind of clashing. I don't know. But they could solve it. By making the decision to live in harmony. We can make the decision to be easier to get along with or hard to get along with. The idea is, come on guys, make the decision to be easy to get along with. Don't find things to be in conflict about with this other person all of the time. Be of the same mind and look at what he says, in the Lord. If you can have a good relationship with Jesus, you can have a good relationship with each other. That's the idea. And then he says in verse 3, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. True companion. Who is the true companion? I don't know. You can read a lot of speculation about it. One idea that's kind of interesting is maybe that this, the Greek word for companion, maybe that was this guy's name. And it's kind of a call out to the brother in the church whose name actually means companion. That's one idea. Another idea that it's Epaphroditus. It would be rather strange for him to kind of include this admission to Epaphroditus since he was sitting right there with him in the same room. I don't know who this brother is. It's interesting, though, to point out um, that these women were going to need a little bit of help from this guy. And whoever he is, they needed some help to kind of resolve this matter to kind of smooth things out so they could find a way forward. They just needed to work together on this to fix things so they could move forward. And then Paul mentions here, this is just wonderful. He said, these women have helped me in the gospel. And how did they help him? Well, we don't know. The church there, I'm sure, knew. In the early days of the church in Philippi, it was a, there was a heavy women population. It starts out with Lydia and her household, and you don't have strong male leadership. That's why they're meeting out by the river. There's a group of Jewish women doing that. Maybe they were part of that group. Maybe they were part of those early days in the church. I don't know. But they've been extremely important in the work. And not just to Paul. It mentions here that they've also helped this guy named Clement. 
And there are historical characters named Clement. There's a letter you can read from a guy named Clement. Uh, that's kind of one of the most famous letters of what's called like a, the church fathers. Not my phrase. That's just a phrase you'll run across. This is not that guy. This Clement is just a guy from Philippi. Maybe these other Clements that we read about in history are named after him. I don't know. This is just a guy known here in Philippi. And he's involved in the local work there. And these women have been instrumental in helping him. And then on he goes. He says, not just me, but and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They've helped a lot of other people. These two sisters have been really helpful in the work of the church. Really helpful. And they've helped a lot of people whose names are in the book of life. In other words, I may not list them here, but God knows. God's been keeping track of all of this. So they're very useful in the work. Extremely useful. So let's solve this problem so we can keep going. Do you see the thing that would prevent them from <clears throat> kind of cruising down the pathway of peace here is this conflict. All of a sudden this conflict comes and it stops. All this spiritual work they've done, it stops. All the good things they've done to support the church, it's paralyzed. And they're not able to do what they've done. They're not able to be what they've been in the church because they've got this conflict that they just can't get past. And he says, come on, guys, we've got bigger things to do here. We've got to keep adding names to this book, this book of life. This is the book of those who are forever saved. We want to keep adding names to it. And you sisters, you need to keep working with people to help get that done. You're very important to the church. So let's solve this problem. So here's the takeaway for us. You know, we, relationships are complicated, aren't they? Friendships are complicated. Relationships in the church can be complicated. No one's trying to say that's not true. But we can, all of us, make the decision to be harmonious, to be a person who is working to get along with other people. And when you find yourself in a moment where you're having a difficult time, don't get stuck. Don't let that conflict prevent you from continuing down the path of peace. Find a way to resolve it. Find a way to resolve it. The pathway of peace is the path of resolution. Let's notice second of all, it's the path of focus. And this section, I'll just mention this idea to you. Um, it could be that this entire section is talking to Yodia and Syntyche and telling them what they need to do. So it's maybe immediately an application of this challenge. <clears throat> but it's impossible to read it without recognizing the wider ability to apply it. Sure, it maybe was applying to their situation in particular. <clears throat> but which of us can read these verses and not think, boy... Those, those are really good for me to read. That's exactly what we think every time we read them, all of us. Here's Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, talking about our focus, the way our minds are trained, the way we're working our minds. Here's what it says. Notice the commands here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Now we see this term peace scattered throughout this reading. Peace doesn't just show up. Peace is something we are pursuing. There's a pathway toward peace. And that pathway toward peace includes 
making sure we are focused on the right things. Number one command, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. That does not mean always be happy. It doesn't mean always be in a good mood. That's not what that means. Although if you are always in a good mood, that's great. That's fine. That's not what this passage is, is talking about. This passage is talking about a decision that we make to do something. In particular, the best synonym is the word celebrate. You should celebrate what you have in Christ. And if you're really sad, you can be celebrating what you have in Christ. If you're happy, you can celebrate what you have in Christ. If you're confused, you can celebrate what you have in Christ. Whatever the, the circumstance may be, you can celebrate. Our moods may fluctuate. Our ability to celebrate is always there. Always. And so you can celebrate those things by walking through them in your mind and thinking about the good things you have in the Lord and acknowledging the surpassing value of all of those things. And so no matter what, we can celebrate the forgiveness of sins. No matter what, we can celebrate the fact that we can have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. No matter what, we can celebrate, etc., etc. On we could go forever talking about the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Always. That is maturity. Maturity in Christ is healthy consistency. When we are young in Christ and we're just learning, there's an awful lot of you know, fluctuation and bouncing around and all of that. The more mature we become in Christ, the more consistent we become in healthy things. This is one of those things that we rejoice always. That's always what we do. And it's so important, he says, and again, I want to tell you, rejoice. Don't leave this behind. So all of the time, every day, as you're going through your life, whatever the season, celebrate what you have in Christ. The second command, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. <clears throat> the word gentleness is kind of difficult to translate into English. It's a unique little term. My favorite little definition I ran across looking at this here is the idea of sweet reasonableness. So there's a pleasantness to this term, an approachableness, a willingness to listen, a willingness to learn, a willingness to discuss, an openness. That's what this term means. And that's kind of who you should be and let that be known to everybody. You'd be that way to everybody. In other words, you know, you don't ever have to have, their, well, this person is this way, so I really got to put up this hard edge with them, be grouchy toward them. No, you don't. We don't ever have to do that. And yes, some people are mean, and some people are going to come at you and all of that. That doesn't mean that's how you have to behave, ever. Well, they're going to take advantage of me. Not necessarily. We don't have to act like the world to be safe. Be reasonable. And it's okay if we're pleasant as we're reasonable. <laughs> that doesn't make us vulnerable or weak. And it doesn't mean we have to compromise on everything and give up everything and everybody else gets to do whatever they want and I just constantly give away the farm, so to speak. That doesn't have to be that way. We should be reasoned. We should let that be known to all men. So that should be the way we are with everybody. And that should be kind of how we are seen. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. And so the, maybe that's talking about the last day. Maybe that's talking about the fact that the Lord is always with us. Probably the second one. The Lord's always close. Always close. So... In every single interaction you have, pretend like God is there because He is. He's always watching. So rejoice and let your gentleness be known. And number, uh, verse number six, be anxious for nothing. 
This particular term, to be anxious, this term means like care. And sometimes it has a positive connotation, sometimes it has a negative connotation. So it's used like in Philippians 2 and 20 to talk about Timothy and his care for the church. Or it's used in 1 Corinthians 12 to talk about our care one for another in the body. So sometimes it's used in a positive sense. Several times in the New Testament it's used in a negative sense. As in the sense of a distracting care. It's a distracting care. Or maybe we could say a paralyzing care. Here's the way Lytle and Scott and their uh, lexicon, the way that they explain it, it is to care for, be anxious about, think earnestly upon, or scan minutely. Scan minutely. What is this verse forbidding? I think that last one, it really gets to it. Scan minutely. You ever get stuck on something that, that is a, um, something you're, that is happening in your life and you're unsure about it and you just run it and run it and run it and run it and that's all you do. That's all you do. And relationships are affected by it. Your work is affected by it. All sorts of things. You're distracted by it because you're just running it. Reminds me of a little, of a dog we had. He wasn't little really, he was a beagle, but his name was Lazarus. We had as a little boy, or as, when I was a little kid. And Lazarus had this trail in our backyard. And he, you know, he's a beagle, so he wants to sniff and bark and all that stuff. Well, he did that all day on the exact same trail every day. So you walk out in our backyard and you could see where Lazarus had walked. And he just kept walking and walking and walking. And he never went anywhere unless we took him for a walk or whatever, uh, which we did sometimes. But anyway, he would just do that little loop every day. Every day. That's what this is talking about. And we just wear those places in our mind. We just build this little thing in our mind where our mind is just running there all the time. And what is that? That is paralyzing. Remember, the thing about the pathway of peace is we don't build a path to stand still. We build a path to go forward. When it says be anxious for nothing, it means don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. When we have cares and concerns, yes, don't get stuck on one of them where it's all you think about. Instead, what do we do with it? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so there's the prescription. There's the action. We should pray about it. The verbiage here, in everything. So we're always going to take this approach as we're going through life. By prayer and supplication, kind of difficult to differentiate these two terms. Maybe the positive and negative side of our prayer life, whatever. There are two different components of our requests, though. The next one is, is to let your requests be made known. Requests, that's very specific. You know, in our prayers, we, we don't just necessarily, sometimes we pray these kind of big picture prayers. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. When we run into these moments where we've got a challenge, God says, let your requests be known. That's detailed. That's specific. That's the result of really thinking about it so you can communicate it to God. Let your requests be made known. And these requests are made up of prayers and supplications. Maybe the positive and negative side of your prayer life. There's an important little concept thrown in here though. All of that done with thanksgiving. So we've got to be thankful. We are not going to see our lives well if we are not thankful. If in these moments all we see are problems, we won't see well. We won't see the path ahead. We will not know what to do. Yes, we have problems and God knows that and He wants him, us to talk to Him about them. We have difficult moments. Yes, we do. 
All of that is true, and God wants to hear about that from you. And He wants to hear about it from me. But as we do that, we have to include thanksgiving. If we don't, we won't see it well. So tell Him what's in your heart. Tell Him what you're thinking. Tell Him the good, the bad, and otherwise. Let your request be made known to Him. And make sure you keep thanksgiving in there. So there's those commands, right? Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known. And be anxious for nothing. The result of being anxious for nothing is the peace of God. That means the peace that comes from God, which is impossible to explain, he says, is going to guard your hearts and minds. It's going to guard you emotionally and intellectually. You're going to be protected. This process protects us. It protects us. And making sure we don't get stuck, but that we have this action that we follow, that we take our requests to God. That protects us. And the peace that comes from God is what protects us both emotionally and intellectually. And then he says in verse 8, let's think. He says, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on these things. There's the emphasis. Here's what you think about. Instead of scanning our problems minutely to the point where we don't see anything else in life, here's what you scan minutely. You scan the things that are true, which means things that are valid or reliable. Scan things that are noble, which these are things that are honorable, worthy of reverence. Just, which are things that are righteous, meeting God's mighty standard of right and wrong, and therefore receiving God's approval. Things that are pure, which are things that are undefiled, suitable to bring to God Himself. Things that are lovely, things, in other words, which call forth love. Things that are of good report, things fit for God Himself to hear, things you would want to tell God Himself. The word virtue, if there's anything virtuous, that means excellent, morally and spiritually excellent, and praiseworthy, things that good men, good things that good men would praise or good things that God would praise, meditate on these things. As I worked through this list this time, the thing that kind of jumped out at me, I've worked through this list a bunch of times, probably you have too. But this time I really began to recognize the importance in each of these things. As you go through each of these lists, learn to see what God sees. And learn to see what He sees. In each of these, what does God see that's true? What does God see that's lovely? What does God see that's pure? And I want to learn to think like He thinks. I want to think about stuff that I would be happy to share with Him. So there's where we want to put our minds. That's what we want to meditate upon. That's what we want to scan minutely. And as we're doing that, we're spending our time thinking about what God thinks. How He would see things. What He would prefer. And we want to merge our own thought process with God's thought process. We want those to be as close together as as possible. The path of peace is, is the path of resolution and it is a path of focus, of thinking about the right things in the right way. Let's talk next about the idea that the path of peace is the path then of contentment. Let's read verses 10 through 20 together. Um, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. 
You Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so let me just hit the main point of this before we get started going through the details. How does contentment relate to the pathway of peace? What is the connection between all this? First of all, contentment derives from peace. It's a result of the peace of God. This is where we are. That we, because we are good with God, we're good with everything. But here's the connection to the idea of a pathway. You know, sometimes we get it in our mind. But, and I, I'm going to just tell you, I've been guilty of this myself before. Probably every one of us here has. Before I can make progress, I need fill in the blank. Got to get this to line up, and I, I just can't go forward. And you can't see a way forward because I need whatever. And you know, when I was young, it's like I need 20 bucks. I don't have 20 bucks. <laughs> and I have $20 today. But you know, you could just keep having whatever that is. I can't go forward until I get whatever. Yes, you can. The, the idea of contentment is you have what you need right now. That's contentment. When we lack contentment, well, we've got to have whatever before we can get there. And here, life's going to be good whenever this. That's chasing contentment. So when we've got contentment, we've got what we need today. That's the concept of contentment. Now let's walk through what this has to do, first of all, with Paul, as he talks about his own personal example here, starting in verse 10 of Philippians 4. He says that uh, in verse 10 there, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. There's that word rejoiced. There's an example of rejoicing. Here's something in particular he himself rejoices over, is the way his needs have been met and the relationship that is existing between him and the Philippians. That is something he celebrates. And he says, um, you know, that you guys are interested in me and you wanted to help me. You didn't have the opportunity. Now you've had it. It's just all great. Just wonderful. And I want you to know, he says in verse 11, I don't, I'm not talking about need because I've learned to be content. I've learned it. Paul could have said the same thing as I said this morning. That he could think of times in his life where he needed whatever before he could go forward. He learned it. Contentment is something that is learned. It doesn't necessarily come natural. It's learned. And contentment is the result of learning to live in the security of the peace that God provides. And learning to live that way is a process. We're learning. And once we understand the peace that God has provided us, this freedom from the guilt of our sin, this fellowship that we have with each other, this resolution to our own personal shortcomings, our own personal sins, the peace on those three different levels, once we appreciate that peace in our life, we realize we're good. We're good. The things that matter most are taken care of by God in Christ. And now we're good. I've got what I need. And God is going to take care of me. And so Paul says in verse 12 that I know how to have this mindset when I'm abased and when I'm abound. You know, you would think it would be just one of those. You would think it'd be you need to learn contentment when you're abased, when you don't have. Well, we do. We need to learn contentment in that moment. 
We need to learn when we're having difficult moments and we don't have everything we need to be content then. But he had to learn it when he abounded too. And so it's an interesting thing in the Bible, really success is really actually very dangerous. It's very dangerous. And as you read through the stories of the Bible, a lot of times these great characters, they have their hardest moments when they've been successful. So David, you know, when he's out in the middle of the wilderness with a bunch of outcasts and ne'er-do-wells in a cave, when he's faithful to God, he's writing these beautiful psalms, he's doing all these good things, then he gets in a palace in Jerusalem and his army is so powerful he doesn't even have to go out with them and they can win anyway. I mean, he is just knocking it out of the park. And what does he do? He commits adultery and he lies and he commits murder and he wrecks his family when everything is good. He destroyed his family. Not when he was in the middle of nowhere fighting to survive. He destroyed his family when he succeeded. So we got to learn contentment when we're abased, when we don't have 20 bucks. But we got to learn to be content when we got a lot more than 20 bucks, too. And it's not just money either, is it? There's a lot of other things we could throw in there. We got to be content always. Because the contentment doesn't really kind of, you know, fluctuate based on our earthly circumstances. Our contentment is a spiritual thing. And the peace that God gives us, that's a spiritual thing. And you're not going to find it in some place or some status. You're going to find it only in Christ. And what is the key? Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's the key of contentment. Whatever life brings, success, defeat, good, bad, whatever, I can do it. What a blessing that Christians get to own this verse. Uh, There's just no telling for each of us how much this verse has done to help this congregation right here this morning to continue to advance. And I know for me personally, this verse means more to me than I can possibly explain. And I know it does to many, maybe all of you as well. What an incredible thing to be able to say all the time. And when you find yourself facing this impossible circumstance, can you do it? Yes, I can do all things through Christ. That means I can meet every moment of life. That's what that means. Whatever life brings, I can can go through those moments and I can go to heaven at the end. Why? Because of Christ. Because of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't do them alone. God doesn't leave us alone. Christ strengthens us through those times. Both in defeat and in success. That is why we are content. This verse, verse 13, is why we are content. Now verse 14 talks about the part the Philippians have played in it. You know one of the ways God helps us It's through our relationship with each other in the church. And one of the reasons Paul could be content is because there were churches like Philippi concerned about him and wanting to help him. And so he says, hey, you guys have been shared with me in my distress. Here you are with me. This is one of the ways Jesus is strengthening Paul is through the Philippians. And he says, in fact, you guys have been doing this a long time. Verses 15 and 16 talks about the time when they helped him in Thessalonica. This is interesting. The church in Philippi starts in Acts 16. Paul goes to Thessalonica in Acts 17. There's not very much time in between the two. And they, according to this passage, they sent to him more than one time to support him in Thessalonica. So this church is doing this right off the bat. And by the way, Thessalonica was a really, really difficult work. Not difficult because of the church there, difficult because of the opposition he ran into from Jewish leaders. They hate him there. And they have, I'm not going to go into the details, but the city of Thessalonica has a unique freedom. 
They don't care what the Roman government says. They can do whatever they want to to anybody who's in Thessalonica. They are a free city. So that threat was real to him there. And what does the church at Philippi do? They support him over and over. They're, we're with you. We're not with you in Thessalonica, but we're with you. That kind of steadfast fellowship between Paul and Philippi was part of what helped him learn to be content because he had these brethren with him. And it wasn't, he says in verse 17, for his own personal enrichment that he was concerned about all this. He was worried about the fruit, the result of the work. Helping people learn about Christ. That's what it was all about. And so in verse 18, we've got it. We've got what we need to be able to do that. Epaphroditus brought it to me. And their own contribution to him, he describes it as a sacrifice. It's interesting terminology. You know, our, our contribution that we're going to do this morning is a sacrifice. And the way we use it, it's like a sweet-smelling aroma because it is pleasing to God. Isn't that a wonderful idea that we can use this in a way that is pleasing to God? And so, this morning, because of the contribution that has been made to this, the treasury here at Norman, <clears throat> I got pictures this morning of communion tables set in Uganda. I get them every Sunday morning. When I wake up Sunday morning, I have usually between like 20 and 30 messages on my WhatsApp from Uganda. I get messages from there almost every day. Why? Because the work is growing. It's growing. And the church here has been able to be part of that. Just like Philippi was part of Paul's work. Those kinds of relationships created by God Himself give us the confidence that we can be content. Verses 19 and 20 gives God the credit for all of it. God's going to supply. God's going to keep giving the church at Philippi what they need to carry out the work and it's all going to ultimately result in glory being brought to Him. The path of contentment. I have what I need to move forward today. I have it right now because of what God has given me in Christ. And so today, right now, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I don't do it alone. We don't have to do it alone. We have Christ with us and we have our brothers with us. And so on we go today. The pathway of peace is the pathway of resolution, of focus, and of contentment. The last I want to mention to you very briefly is the very end of the book of Philippians. Notice as we read these last three verses, the emphasis again on every. All the way through Philippians, he's talking about all the saints, everybody there, all the members. And guess how he ends the book? The same way. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Greet every saint. And all the brethren here greet you. And all these greetings include everybody. Everybody, everybody. We're all together. All together. And you've got people in unique circumstances like these folks working in Caesar's household. And they have unique opportunities and challenges and things like that, just like today. We have folks that sometimes have unique opportunities or challenges or whatever. But we're all together. So what do you do with that? Well, greet everybody. Greet everybody. And you know, I think, I believe that literally. Like when I, when I am here, I really want to shake everybody's hand. I really do. And we may not have a deep talk about our deepest hopes, dreams, and fears. I'm happy to have those conversations sometimes, but we don't always do that. Sometimes it's just a, hey, how you doing? And my goal coming to church is to greet everybody. That's the way my mom taught me. That's what Megan taught our kids to do from the time they were little. Why did they teach that? Because that's what the Bible encourages us to do. Greet everybody. Greet everybody. So this church here, we do a good job of that. We usually start just a little bit late because we're so anxious, or not anxious, but so excited about greeting everybody. And that's good. That's great. And we, we get to chat and say, how you doing? And all that sort of a thing. That's the way it should be in the church. And we want everybody greeting everybody. This morning, the pathway of peace is the pathway of progress. 
Don't get stuck. Don't stop. Keep going. Keep going. And keep going by resolving your conflicts, by focusing on the right things, by learning to be content, and by being together as a congregation. This morning, this is God's path, the path that He provides that protects us, that blesses us, that enables us to live a good life here for Him and eternal life together with Him in heaven, of course. This is our study on the book of Philippians as we've now come to the conclusion of Paul's letter to this good church. As we come to the end of our study this morning, we want to invite you to obey the gospel. If you're here and you've never obeyed, we want to encourage you to follow God's plan of salvation. If you have obeyed but you've strayed away, we encourage you to make correction this morning. Want to be the case, please come while we stand and while we